Hi everyone, I'm Magic Cat Jenny and today I'm going to be sharing with you what I learned while watching Jacob's Backstage Pass. Yes. Yes. Okay, so Jacob Brent recently did a live stream on his YouTube channel giving a commentary backstage pass, as it were, of the filming and production of Cat's 1998 video. I always called it the video or the VHS. Some people call it the DVD because they're younger than me. Um, it's the video. It's the VHS. It's the 1998 filmed production of the stage musical of Cats. Jacob Brent played Mr. Mistopheles in said production. He was also Mistopheles on Broadway and the West End. He gives us some very interesting production behind the scenes but more than that, he talks about the plot and what he considers to be the true story of Cats. Now he says that this is from his memory and Cats seems to be something that everyone has a slightly different memory of. Um, it's what he remembers being told, it's his take, um, what Trevor Nunn and Julian Lynn told him, and I'm not sure if that's just for the filming of Cats or if this is what he learned about the characters from being on Broadway and on the West End. As far as I know, there really isn't much that is actually canon about the Cats story beyond what you can see from watching it, beyond what is in the songs. There's a few things like uh, Cory Capat and Tantamile are twins. That is canon, but that is also kind of hard to misinterpret. Um, but things like Mongo Jerry and Rumple Teaser, are they siblings? Are they lovers? Different productions play it differently. So saying that Jacob Brent's interpretation is canon is a bit misleading, but it's definitely one supported interpretation. This is a fun version though, and I'd love to see someone do some art or stories based around this version. It's a very um, interesting one. Now this video is still currently live on his channel, so if you'd like to watch Cats and listen to his commentary, I suggest to go ahead and do that. It's a really fun experience. Um, but I just wanted to give you the highlights, things that I found interesting. Um, and Jacob Brent, if you happen to be watching this, thank you so much for being a big part of my childhood. Um, this is the first version of Cats I ever saw because I grew up in Southern California. Um, and I love it. And Mistopheles is my favorite character. He's the reason for my username, my YouTube channel name, <laughs> um, and the first Cats costume I ever did for my own little unofficial production. <laughs> so truly, Jacob, thank you. Um, this was so great. I hope you do more live streams like this in the future. Tell us more. We want all the backstage knowledge and stories and etc. So here we go. Demeter has been previously kidnapped by McCavity. She knows that tonight is a jellical ball, so she chooses to escape and run to the junkyard because hopefully the other jellicals will be able to help her uh, defend against McCavity if he comes for her. So we start with her running away, basically. Car coming over across the stage, her hissing, that's her. Now we as the audience are actually a part of the show. Cats know we're here. They're allowing us to be here. They're saying, as I quote, you sit down and we'll tell you a story. I like this interpretation. I think it makes a lot of sense. The mystical divinity is the Pledge of Allegiance for the Jellicles. So the cats have all received their invitations for the ball. Jenny and Jelly have put up the Christmas lights. They're the ones responsible for decorating the junkyard for the ball um, in advance. Uh, Rum Tum Tugger, um, he mentions that Tugger and Ball Ballerina like to play, that they don't like each other, uh, but they really do. Um, Tugger is inspired by Mick Jagger, Elvis, Little Richard, and a bit of David Bowie, which, yes, all, yes to all of those. Here's where things get interesting. 
he mentions that Grizabella was part of the Jellicles, but decided to leave to pursue a famous career in acting or singing. He says his actress. I think he says famous actress. Um, and she fails, falls on hard times, and basically becomes a fallen star. She's not necessarily old, like some productions may seem to make her. Um, she's just fallen. And she's come back for forgiveness uh, on this night because, like Demeter, she knows that it's the Jellical Ball. So she chooses this time to come back. Um, and Demeter has seen her walking around the streets because Demeter has been out there because she was captured by the cavity. So she's seen Grizabella around. Um, and all the adults in the tribe know who she is because they remember what she used to be a part of them. Um, but all the kittens don't, which is why they're a little bit more curious, a little bit more keen to perhaps reach out to her. Um, and he also mentions that Bamba and Grizz uh, were BFFs, best friends, and around the same age. He mentioned that Grizabella and Monkey Strap have a little thing. Now, I'm not sure if he's saying that they had a thing, like they were a thing in the past, or if he's just referencing the moment in the song Grizabella that's happening when he, uh, when she's addressing him, um, speaking directly to him. So I, I feel like it's that. I feel like he's not saying that they had a thing, but I don't know. Um, let me know what you think uh, on that. So Demeter is singing about Grizabella and explaining her story since she's the one who has seen her around and knows a bit of her story. And this is the first time that the younger kittens learn of her name. This is all really interesting. I remember in my fan fiction, I had her at the age of like Gus and Old Deuteronomy. Um, the note I have about Bustopher Jones is that Mistopheles loves Bustopher Jones because, and I quote, we look the same, but he's not my dad. I always had in my stories that he was definitely his dad. Um, but, of course, that's based on a 12 to 13 year old's interpretation and also being very heavily influenced by fan websites at the time. Like, I had my own fan website, little GeoCities thing. Um, but I also went to a lot of other ones. And at the very beginning there, I took what they said as canon because I didn't know any better. Um, and so I based my fan fiction around some random fans, like, this is what is happening in, ca like, some other fans' version. <laughs> so, I don't know, I, it's, that's, that's an old one, but I still, like, I still have it in my memory of, like, what my story was, which you will never read. <laughs> Not good. Um, okay, Old Deuteronomy. The cats are cleaning themselves as they listen to the story of Old Deuteronomy, and Old Deuteronomy does not come to every ball. Interesting. Um, so it's huge that he's coming to this one, and there's a reason. Um, I thought that was really interesting, because I took it as, like, it happens every year, and he's there every year, but that's the only time he, like, that they're all together and he's there with them. But... If he doesn't come to every ball, how do does he send a cat to the heavy side lair? Because don't they send a cat to the heavy side lair every year? Once a year, you know. So that's interesting. Um, he mentions that Jenny Annie Dots and Skimble Shanks are just friends. Uh, I think there was like a photo from maybe like the back of the DVD or some. It was a promotional photo somewhere uh with like skimble shanks laying down a jenny and it's like laying on top of him and i think like some fan website had that up and people were like it's it jenny and skimble they're canon that's that's the story but um he's saying that they're just friends so the peaks and the pollicles is a show that they put on for old deuteronomy making fun of dogs uh, Mongo, Jerry, and Rumpel Teaser uh, missed rehearsals because they were stealing stuff. That checks out. 
Um, Tugger also missed rehearsals. So all three of them end up messing up at various times, frustrating Monkey Strap further and further. Um, oh, Monkey Strap sounds like me during my own personal production of Cats. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fun. It was a good time. Um, um, oh, and he mentions that um, Tugger wants the thing to be all about himself, hence the bagpipe solos that Monkey Strap does not like. Um, and in Midas, the character in Midas is playing the part of the Rumpus Cat. The Rumpus Cat is not an individual character. He is a character in their show for Old Deuteronomy, which is what I had always interpreted as, as well. Um, and then, and this is really interesting because I never thought of it this way, but then they get punished by Old Deuteronomy because he is saying that you shouldn't make fun of dogs because dogs and cats are the same. And I never thought of it that way, that little bit he sings right after, where it gets kind of like dark and scary, and he's like yelling almost. I never thought he was like yelling at them for that reason, but it makes so much sense. I really like that interpretation. Um, I don't know what I thought it was. I thought he was just like getting weird, getting like sensing something and warning them about, I don't know. It, it, Jacob's version makes a lot more sense. Um, okay. He mentions offhand that Jemima and Victoria are BFFs which is super cute. Um, I kind of had it as Jemima. Sorry, I keep saying her name is Jemima. I do this in videos all the time. Her name is Jemima. I've been mispronouncing it since I was little. Because they don't sing her name. Anyways. Um, and I think because I called the duck or the goose in like... Um, Peter Rabbit stories, her name's Jemima, but I think I called her Jemima, so when I see that name, I don't know. Anyways, um, <laughs> this is fun. The Jellicle Ball, the start of the Jellicle Ball, is known as the Ritual, and this is when they all get into that sort of triangle formation, I think, with Victoria at the front. That's the Ritual, that's the start of the Ritual, and... It's something that's so interesting because Jacob was saying that if you do that little bit of choreography, anyone who's been in Cats knows it and like you just have this instant connection with them. And it's so funny because that is part of the choreography self-taught when I self-taught myself by watching the video on a little tiny TV through a mirror so that I would do it not mirrored. Um, I always remember that part and that's like, if I'm ever, you know, randomly like, oh, I'm gonna do some cat dances, like I'm dressed up as cats for a Halloween or something. I'll do that part of the dance and I never knew it was called the ritual. Maybe that's like something well known. I just, I'm not aware of it, um, till now. So that's kind of cool. Um, all right, then... He goes on to say so many interesting things throughout the whole Jellicle Ball dance number, um, like receiving the moonlight, drugged, being possessed by it, and then the frenzy starts. And then there's this part, he said, kind of like a nod to Phantom, to masquerade in Phantom, except not because cats came first. So Phantom is a nod to cats. I don't know. Lots of interesting things going on there. Um, the downstage bit that Miss Owen tumbled it is called Firebird, uh, and he normally doesn't do that. Mistopheles normally doesn't do that, but he got to do it. Um, there's a move called British Airways where they're following airplane. They go out. Um, he mentioned a lot of different interesting names to choreography, so I definitely go back and watch him talk about all of that. Um, okay. There's a lot of behind the scenes things that I'm not mentioning that I do have in my notes because I feel like you should really hear it from him. Um, because the video is still up. If he ever takes it down and people missed it, I'll make another video where I kind of tell you everything. But um, while it's live, you should you should watch it. Um, so back to the plot. 
because that's what this video is about. Um, the dance between Victoria and Plato, he calls the awakening of Victoria. And he said it is not a mating dance. And you know the big kitten pile or the cat pile around them? It's, they're not mating. They're just cleaning and licking and having community. So take that as you will. Um, all right. So Grizabella comes back. They decide to show off again. Um, and then there's a bit where the males and the females kind of like have their own little groups competing, like dance fighting, basically, uh, for fun. Um, and, and I know this is, I know this next bit isn't like a plot thing, but I just find it really cool that John Partridge was the only tugger uh, to dance this part, the part when they're like running and leaping, um, because he originally was Alonzo. So that's cool. He is he really good, really good rum tum tugger. Okay, so when we get to the end of Act One, Grizabella is trying to relive her past. But it's not working out the way she wants it to. She thinks she's alone. She doesn't see old Deuteronomy watching her, but he is. And this is the moment where he knows it is Grizabella that he must choose to go to the heavy side lair. Um, beginning of Act Two. Okay. This is interesting. Uh, this, he gets very in-depth talking about the moments of happiness, which I found really wonderful because I absolutely love the moments of happiness. Not everybody does. Some people find it boring. I love it. I think it's one of the best moments of the show because I, I always thought it was just so deep. And what Jacob has said is, so what Jacob said is that this is the moment where Old Deuteronomy explains what just happened with Grizabella. Um, he's learned her story and he's attempting to convey to them that they need to come together and forgive Grizabella. Uh, and they need to look into their own lives and realize that they've all been there. They're all capable of being there and that they're all one. They're all the same. This could happen to any of them. They need to come together. They need to find it out. They need to find out and discover that as a group. Um, he doesn't tell them who to choose. He doesn't say we need to choose Grizabella. He basically tells them, him, them all this information uh, because they need to come together as a tribe and collectively decide that it should be Grizabella. Um, and I find it interesting because he doesn't actually like in the lyrics say, hey, I, I saw Grizabella talk about this stuff. He, it's, the lyrics are very in, different. But I can kind of see that being the case. And they haven't actually seen Grizabella tell her story yet, which of course they will eventually at the end. Um, so it's interesting to see what, what they're each individually interpreting it as. Like, like it's, it's interesting. Like maybe some of them are getting it right, right off the bat. Maybe some of them are not. I think it's something that they all eventually do come to at the end, but this is sort of just them being like, okay, this is, this is old Deuteronomy, it's his interpretation of, of what he just saw. So they're taking it in. Um, then, and this part I love, um, cause it's with Jemima, Jemima, who's my favorite female character right after Misafli. They're at least, at least that's the order I would have placed them in as a little tween watching cats. There's this energy in the ground. I don't know from where, but uh, Jemima, it, it flows through the twins and up through Jemima and she stands up to sing. Uh, she's the voice of innocence. And then after which all of the Jellicles feel the energy through the ground, like the roots of a tree coming into you and the energy building so you have nothing else to do but stand. Um, entranced by a light, a new life, the vision. You see the vision, but then it disappears. Um, and that's all stuff that Jacob said. Interpret that as you will. I think it's really nice. I think it's... I think it's... It's nondescript as to what is, like, actually happening, but I... 
think that it's a feeling more than anything. It, you know, I always interpret it as the everlasting cat speaking through Jemima. Jemima, I'm always, I'm going to keep doing that, you guys. I'm so sorry. Um, speaking up through her and kind of agreeing with old Deuteronomy. That's what I think it is. Um, but then comes Gus. <laughs> Jacob said that Gus might have dementia and that Jelly Lorem is his caretaker. In my story, of course, Jelly Lorem was his daughter. <laughs> but I don't know um, if I think that way anymore. Um, and he says that everyone assumes Gus will be picked. And I also thought that too. Like, I also thought that that's what the cats would assume. Um, and in my stories, he was selected the following year. And the ghost that he sees is apparently uh, young Gus acting. So he's being haunted by the memory of his youth. And then Skimble Shanks, <laughs> as Jacob says, everyone's favorite uncle. <laughs> that's really adorable. I think that's cute. I didn't even write anything down for this. I think he mainly just talks about the experience, not really like facts or plot things. So if you want to know about Skimble, go watch, go watch Jacobs. Um, he did say that he was going to talk about Growl Tiger, but he didn't. Um, and he said that he does prefer Growl Tiger. I don't know why he said it at this point, but he did. Um, he said, being a pirate cat is fun. Here's where it gets juicy. McCavity is not a part of their tribe. When he appears, Demeter is frenzied because she's just escaped him and now he's here. Um, and he also mentioned that McCavity doesn't necessarily have powers. And then he threw a little shade to the movie. Uh, he says that he cannot make the cats disappear and reappear in a barge somewhere. That's not McCavity. <laughs> Ugh. Hilarious. Um, ah. McCavity is not magical, apparently. Um, he says that McCavity is a bad boy that Bombalurina secretly likes. I don't think it's so secret. <laughs> um, uh, Mongo Jerry, she mentions that Mongo Jerry worked for McCavity, um, he said that Mongo got mixed up in McCavity's thing, but he's not necessarily bad or mean, which that's exactly what I interpret that as as well. Um, oh, and at the end, after the fight, when he has the, um, when he has the jumper cables, he doesn't necessarily electrocute them, he just cuts out the power. So Mistopheles trick for making Old Deuteronomy reappear is the first time he's done that trick. So he's very proud of himself. Um, he also mentioned that Old Deuteronomy is Mr. Mistopheles' dad. And that's why Mr. Mistopheles has magical powers, because Old Deuteronomy has magical powers. So, rewind. Mistopheles is magic. McCavity is not. Old Deuteronomy is magic. I think that's it. And the twins have psychic abilities. Michael Gruber said that in an interview, perhaps, that Old Deuteronomy has fathered many of the cats in the junkyard. Um, so that checks out. Definitely, definitely checks out as being very plausible. Um, but he also says that Mistopheles doesn't know that, that Old Deuteronomy is his dad. I think that's what he said. Again, I would have loved to have heard this back in the late 90s when I was at the very beginning of this decades long fandom. <laughs> uh, of course, he didn't call them fandoms back then, or at least I didn't. Um, obsession, I think is what I would have said. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a it's a interesting interpretation and probably informed a lot of the performances. Um, again, I don't think there's really much that can be canon about this show because there's so many different 
versions of it, so many different kinds of productions. Um, it's such a... It's such an experience. And I think, you know, us fans, we know that there is this in-depth plot happening. Um, but I feel the majority of the audience who sees Cats doesn't know any of these things and doesn't necessarily pick up on any of these things. That it, They just kind of experience the whole thing as emotions. And I think that that's just fine. I love that this exists. I love that these sort of backstories exist. Um, I think a lot of fans would argue that the real only canon uh, interpretations of the characters, like their their personalities, are those three words. Uh, those original three words to describe every character. Um, all of this sort of could be considered fan fiction. So like I said, that was Jacob Brent's version of Cats. If you'd like to know some of his behind the scenes stories, you can go watch his live stream, which is currently still live on his channel. What's not live anymore is Angela Lloyd Webber's commentary on Cats, which uh, I also watched. So if you'd like me to make a video talking about that, uh, I can. Just let me know. All right. I'll see you later. Wow.